Good evening, and we're going to open the Bible study with the reading of God's Word from the book of Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. A child who is not taught to fear wrongdoing when he's so small will have great difficulty learning to fear God when he's a man or a woman. That was uh, Elizabeth Elliot said that. And that's the truth. Too many people bring their children up, let them find herself. A child can't find his way out the door with both hands if he's got directions to him. They need guidance, not... Uh, Lazy, fair parents. So remember that. Amen. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be checking on you. I'm gonna be checking on you. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the beautiful day you gave us today. We know that there's some bad weather coming early, later in the week. But Lord God, we we pray that you'll keep everybody safe and keep any destruction of property or loss of life or anything like that to the bare minimum. In fact, we just pray that the storm goes out to sea and doesn't cause any problems at all. Lord, we pray for this Bible study tonight. This is the last chapter of Habakkuk. And Lord God, he's uh, he's going to start off in a prayer. And we're going we're gonna to read his prayer and all the things that go into it to finish this, uh, this book up. Lord God, we uh, pray for all the students here at Flatsy, the ones who come, the ones who don't come. We pray for the families back home. We pray for each and every one. And there was a lady I meant to pray for her son, and I forgot to pray for her and her son. Her name is Cherry, and her son's name is Brandon. Uh, I met her a few years ago and lost touch, but uh, she, she had brain cancer, and she's still kicking and moving forward, and now her son's got the same cancer she had. And he's, he's going in for treatment and everything now. But Lord God, we lift both these people up to you for your hand of healing and strengthening. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you'll touch each and every one of them's heart. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, third, third and final chapter of Habakkuk. What did we say was different about Habakkuk versus the other prophets? Miss Terry, you didn't hear my question? You weren't listening, okay. Oh, okay. I said, what was unique about Habakkuk concerning the other prophets? He was questioning God, that, that's, that's right. He was questioning God, questioning about why he was using a, a more wicked people to discipline his his chosen people, and just asking all kinds of questions along that line. And uh, now this is what this this is the last chapter is called Prophet's Prayer. And verse one says, "A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, um, Shignoth." And it says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So there's a few things in, in this, in verse 2. It says, uh, Habakkuk knew, knew the stories of what God, you, you remember, when you read most of the prophets and God's talking, he, he starts off with, uh, I'm the one who led you out of Egypt. He starts with that, and that's what he's doing. He's remembering the things that God has already done to, for his people and to his people. 
He says, Habakkuk knew that the stories of God's mighty acts are celebrated in song and in the feasts and festivals of Israel. These mighty acts included the exodus from Egypt, the miracles of the Red Sea, the conquest of the land. He says, speech here signifies the message of God's great acts rather than the communication process. Afraid as he meditated on God's work in human affairs, Habakkuk was overcome with an awe-inspiring sense of greatness of the Lord. Revive, make it known, Habakkuk prayed for God's renewed involvement in Israel. In the midst of the years, this was a way of calling for a quick response. Now, if you take, take this chapter and break it down, chapter 2, you see a lot of things in here, as it said. I've heard, he, well, he's heard what God has done in the past. And, you know, the financial organizations say past successes or past, uh, we'll call it successes, do not necessarily mirror future success, which means, yeah, we, we had these other guys' money, we did real good with their money. When yours comes, we may not do as well with yours. But that's not what, what he said about with God. He's looking at his past, past efforts, what God had done in the past, and knew that he would do the same in the future. And verse 3 says, well, I'll finish it with verse 2. It says, revive your work in the midst of the years. Take off what you, what you have done and bring it forward. It said, uh, in the wrath of remember mercy, God's wrath was going to be poured out on Judah because of their sin, their idolatry, and everything else. But what he was, he was trying to say was, don't forget, you know, when, when I was little, my dad, if he spanked me, which he didn't do that very often, it's amazing how few times he ever spanked me. But my mother always said, now go hug your daddy's neck. That was a tough thing for a kid to do. Get, get a whipping and hug, go hug his neck. But that's what, this, this is what uh, Habakkuk is asking God to do. Basically, he's, he's basically telling him, you, you go whip him, but when you get done whipping them, make sure you got some, some mercy so that they can come back in and give you a hug and try to get back in your will. Verse 3 does say, though, God came from Timon, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. So verse 3 is, is a poetic reference to God's appearance at Sinai. Selah is probably, and everybody has uh, conjectured what Selah means, but nobody actually knows. But it said it could be a musical term, but its exact meaning is unknown. So it may indicate a sudden shouting of amen. That's, that's the way I take it a lot of times. A uh, moment of silence or a musical chord. But it says, uh, the Holy One from Mount Paran, his, his glory covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. So we see that Habakkuk, He's not questioning. He's just he's just recounting. He said, this is what God has done. This is what he's done. This is what he's going to do. This is what he could do. And he, he's going through all of these things. The four says, his brightness was like the light. He had rays of flashing from his hand. There And there his power was hidden. So Rebekah compared the appearance of God at Sinai to a thunderstorm with its darkness and flashing lights. His power was hidden while God reveals evidence of his power. Its totally and totality and greatness remain hidden. Now if you think about what, what, he's, what he's talking about here is, remember Jesus when he was talking to um, Who, who was who was the who was the priest that Jesus talked to about being twice born? 
goodness gracious, we, we, we were all having a block. <laughs> yeah, I had the same feeling, Nicodemus. That's the same thing that Jesus told Nicodemus. It only took two of us to get that. Nicodemus, Jesus told Nicodemus, talking about the Spirit of God, talking about the wind. You, you see the effects of it, but you don't see the wind. That's what Habakkuk is talking about, the power of God. You can see the effects of but you don't see the power. You don't, you don't see what he did, but you see the effects of it. When Jesus healed somebody, you didn't see all the things that went into healing the person's body. You just saw the person needed healing and was healed. You didn't see all the things that had to happen for, to drive a demon out of somebody. Jesus spoke, get out, and they got out. So that's what he's talking about. You see the effects, but you don't see the power that goes into it. Now, verse 5 says, hmm? Yeah. Verse 5 says, Before him went pestilence, and fever followed at his feet. It says, Pestilence, fever, these plagues are personified as messengers of judgment. And remember, we're always talking about pestilence and uh, it's really the first time I've heard red fever in, in such a way. But God uses these things to, sh to judge his people, to discipline them, just as he used the 10 plagues to discipline and punish Egypt and get them to let his people go, let God's people go. He uses all man. He uses he uses nature, and a lot of times to show his power. He he uses nature to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. If uh, when he parted the Red Sea, and the Israelites went walked across on dry ground, and then the Egyptians went in into the Gulf behind them. Well, he let nature, he, 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 you know, he's, he's holding the water back. When the last uh, Israelite gets through and the last Egyptian gets involved and he takes his hand away and he lets nature take its course, which the sea came back together and drowned the Egyptian army. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Verse 6 says, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. Now, part of, part of six, the, the story behind verse six is in scriptures, a lot of it in poetry too, use poetic language, and it shows. It always talks about mountains quaking, uh, different different things happening to to big inanimate objects and stuff, demonstrating God's power. It doesn't necessarily mean that he, yet that He's split the mountain, which when uh, Jesus steps on the Mount of Olives when He comes back. The second, for the second advent, he's going to split the Mount of Olives and it's going to be a big valley created for, for war. But it's a picture, kind of a picture showing the power of God to do things. And that, that's what Habakkuk is trying to stress in his, in his prayer, that God has all this and he can do all, he can do all these things. It doesn't mean, necessarily mean that he did it. But he can do it all. And if you look at the very first part of verse 6, it says, He stood and measured the earth. Think about what, what that would take in human terms to, for somebody to stand and measure the earth. But God is, God is not human. And 
he's, he's big enough to measure the whole. Or he created everything that's created through the Lord Jesus. So I'm sure standing up and measuring the earth is not a problem for him. Verse 7 says, I saw the tents of Cushion and affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian trembled. O oh Lord, where, O oh Lord, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horse, your chariots of salvation? Thank you. Says, uh, says Cushion and Midian, these tribes are representative of the quaking nations. And then it says, in eight rivers and sea, said, the Lord had divided the Red Sea and the Jordan River for his people to cross, chariots of salvation. The appearance of the Lord was for the purpose of bringing deliverance to his people. And, you know, he, he's, when he called Abraham out, or Abram, as he was known, start with when he called him out he promised him that he was going to be make him into a mighty nation he, he was going to be a blessing to all the nations and all these things that God promised the majority of it other than the son of promise Isaac being born to Sarah the vast majority of it Abram had confidence in God could do it but he didn't see the majority of them. He didn't see the Messiah come. He didn't see that his seed was going to be a blessing to all the nations. And that, uh, he never saw, he never lived in a building. He always lived in a tent. And all the things that God promised him were still in the future. But he believed what God said. He believed that God was going to do the things he said he was going to do. And he trusted God, and when he trusted God, it was, as the scripture says, it was accounted him as righteousness. So when we look at it, that's what, what, he's, what he's doing here. But verse 8 again, it says, Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? Or was that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Well, he's saying, are you angry at the river? You know, he... he he blocked the Red Sea, he blocked the Jordan River alone. The Jordan River only had to stop at one side, the other half would just roll on down. But, um, you okay, Mr. Terry? Verse 9 says, Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows, sea law. You divided the earth with rivers. When it talks about dividing with rivers and things, at one time, man, I don't know that. I don't know that. Nobody else does either. But being divided, he, he talks about the mountains, mountains, rivers, and lakes. All these things divide people out. They separate people out. They separate nations out from each other and from when uh, if you look at the mountain ranges in the world the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Smoky Mountains they run north and south so when they when they were formed after the flood or during the flood anything that was there was still there as far as vegetation and stuff when the mountains formed in Europe, they went east to west. So when the mountain ranges came up, anything nice to grow, or let's say anything that needed to be in a, a, a general climate area, when they, when they split the land, things that had grown in one place because of the mountain ranges, they couldn't anymore. And I don't even know why I told you all that. That's stuff I learned in, in junior high school. 
But it's about the power, the way things worked out after the flood when, when God, when he flooded the world. Because before the world was flooded, everything was a whole lot different than it is now. You didn't have rain and storms like you do now. It wasn't until after the flood that the climate was changed. And you know, these people talk about climate change, climate change. That was real climate change, and God did it. And he was the one who orchestrated it. Just like he's orchestrating all this now. Verse 10 says, The mountains saw you and trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon still stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went. At the shining of your glittering sphere. So we're talking about, you know, again, we're talking about inanimate objects. He's talking about how fearful God is that the mountains would tremble, would quake at his thought. And all, all these things are just another way of saying, God, I know you're all powerful. He said, I know you can do all these things. I know that all this stuff is just just part of who you are. That uh, you don't have to stretch, you don't have to do anything except be who you are and you can do all these things. Verse 12 says, you marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. Yeah. Huh? Did I, did I skip 11? Well, see, that's why I pay you all the big bucks over there. <laughs> 11. No, I read 11. Oh, I read it with 10, though. Not, no, I read 11 with 10. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Terry thought she caught me. <laughs> Most of the time she does, but not today. <laughs> anyway, anyway, verse 12. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. The Lord, I think the biggest part of it is you trampled the nations in anger. Remember the whole story that's been going on with these minor prophets and stuff. You got half of them were prophets of God before the exile, and the rest of them were prophets after the exile. Abaca was before the exile, but it was getting ready to kick off pretty good. But he's seeing, and he says, you marched through the land in indignation, you trampled the nations in anger. He was angry. He was angry with the, the Hebrews. He was angry with the ones he brought in to take the Hebrews out to be the punishment, to be the judgment on the Hebrews until they were, were turned around. So you can look at it and say that he was mad at both of them. He was mad at his people, and the Babylonians were his people too, but they didn't, they didn't believe. As, as a nation, they didn't believe in God, the one true living God. They believed in multi, multiple gods, and he trampled them all in anger. Not at the same time, he, he trampled on J Judah when he brought the Babylonians in to take them out in, in exile. Then, we talked about before he used the Mede Persians to step on the Babylonians. Verse 13 says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. You stuck the head, you struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare from foundations to neck. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. When I read verse 13, a few things jump out at me and shout Jesus all over the place. So you march through the land in indignation, you trample the nations in anger. 
Well, Miss Terry didn't catch me that time. I was on the wrong horse. 13-14, not 12. 13-14 says, You went forth for the salvation of your people, for salvation with your anointed. That's Jesus Christ. You stuck the head, you struck the head from the house of the wicked. That's, that's Satan. That's crushing his head, crushing the serpent's head. By laying bare from foundation to neck, Selah, you thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages. They came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. So verse 13 is, if you read it with an eye towards messianic prophecy, you can see that he's talking about God's anointed. He's talking about Jesus Christ. And the reason, one reason I say that is if you read it, it says for, for salvation, with your is capitalized being god the father anointed being god the son or jesus then you continue reading on through there and then it talks about from the head of the house of the wicked that's talking about satan satan is the head of the house of all the wicked beings in the world he's the head he's the one come on in Anyway, we're talking we're talking messianic prophecies here. In fact, if we could we could probably stay on these verses the rest of the night, but we're not. Going and looking at verse 14, it says, You thrust through with his own thrust through with his own arrows the head of his villages that came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. So it says, um, So the Lord's act of vengeance against the nations would comfort his people. You know, that, that's another thing. The Babylonians come in and oppress the, the Hebrews. They take them out in captivity and exile. When God acts, it finally acts against Babylon, the Hebrews are not sitting there saying, you know what, we got what we deserve. We were not faithful to God. Our ancestors, our predecessors, they weren't faithful to God. And we're stuck stuck here like this for 70 years. We got what we deserved. But what they did instead was they, they rejoiced over their enemy who God used to, to discipline them, rejoiced over their hard times. So that's what I said in here every time that God called the, the Hebrew people out, starting with Abraham, to be an evangelistic people. Go and tell the pagan pagans about me, the one true living God, the great I am. That's all you had to do to be golden was go and tell them and resist worshiping the idols of the pagans. Well, they didn't share God with them, but they would take up the, the idols of the pagans. So they, that's where they failed the biggest part because idolatry and sexual immorality was the biggest thing that caused them problems. That's the biggest thing that happened, that God took them out of, the, out of their land that he gave them forever and took them into exile. But they, they never got, they still don't get it. Verse 15 says, you walk through the sea with your with your horses, though the through the heap of great waters. It says, uh, let me keep going to 15, oh, 16 also. It said, when I heard my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes, when he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. So verse 16 talks about Habakkuk was overcome with a sense of awe at God as well as a sense of his own weakness. He says, for rest in the day of trouble, the prophet encouraged the godly not to be anxious in adversity. You know, that was another message of all the prophets. If you look at it, all the, especially the minor prophets who were preaching 
were, were giving their prophecies before the exile. They were telling them, this is what God's going to do. This is what's going to happen to you. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be just ugly as it can be. But you know what? Rejoice in that because he's disciplining you now to restore you later. Because if he never disciplined Israel, they would have never had a chance to be restored. He, they were just they would have just sunk down in their own pit of immorality, idolatry, and any bad thing you can think of. And they would have just completely destroyed themselves. With him using the Babylon to take them out, I say he took, they took them out before they got to the point of there was no chance of ever restoring them. Verse 17, throughout, or though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there is no herd in the stalls. So, I'll tell you a similar story of what Habakkuk is saying here in verse 17. The young teenage boy is at home talking to his girlfriend. He said, honey, I love you so much that I would walk the widest, hottest desert for you. I love you so much I'd swim the widest Russian river for you. I love you so much I would climb the highest mountain in the world just for a glimpse of you. And if it doesn't rain Saturday night, I'll be over. And that's, that's kind of what I'm getting from Habakkuk here. So though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit on the vines, be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the field fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fall, and there is no herd in the stalls. So he set this up and he said, you know, even if all this stuff fails, even if all this stuff fails, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in God of my salvation. So, he's not quite like the teenager boy. He huh? His vow is trusting. Yes, yeah. But, you know, it just, it just strikes me how, how similar it is. But what the boy said, well, but if it, do, if it doesn't rain, I'll be over Saturday night. Back is sitting there and saying, you know what? If all this stuff happens, I'm going to still trust in the God. And there, there are so many times that we fail, things happen, and we, we fail to just wait on God because a lot of times he brings, it's not so much that he's bringing adversity to us, but he's bringing a, an opportunity to us. But we don't recognize it. And what this opportunity he would be having here was to rejoice in the Lord always, even in times of, of stress and stuff. You know, uh, if, you, if you do the research, John the Baptist lived on wild honey and locusts, but locusts is a plant, not a bug. But he could have lived off of them too. But he would probably have a much better chance of living off of the locust flower. But um, we, we find a way when we trust in the Lord for our provision, even though it looks like the, you know, they're going to shut the government down, they're going to shut everything down, nobody's going to get paid in June. They don't, you didn't never know, say anything about running out of welfare money. It's just military money and stuff like that. And, uh, Retired people. That's the only money that's running out. Everybody else get their money. Do I get too political here? <laughs> but what I'm say, saying is, even with that looming over our heads, we still need to trust in the Lord that He'll provide. And if He, if he doesn't provide outright, He'll provide a way. Just like He provided the, the way for people who who were lost in sin to be redeemed through the shed blood of Christ, just like he did that. 
He'll make, make this happen. Now, I know there's coming a day that all this stuff is going to go down, but it hadn't come yet. But Scripture tells us that. And we talked about it Sunday, that people the other Sunday, that no uh, great nation has lasted over a few hundred years. Now, the Roman Empire lasted a little while, but they were in decline from the time they recognized Christianity as the state of religion, they started in decline right then. But when he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in God of my salvation. If I, if I drop dead right here, right now, Miss Terry, she'd probably be upset. You might even be shocked. But if I did know that I'm, as Billy Graham said, I'm more alive then than I am now. And that, that's kind of what Habakkuk is saying. He said, no matter what happens, I'm going to find my joy in you. And, and people, people are so hung up on finding what makes them happy. You never, you never saw anybody say, man, you know what? My uh, car wouldn't start. It, it took a little bit to get it going, but I got it going. And it just aggravated me to death. Well, you know, I just went up the highway, I saw this bad wreck. Just happened. If I had my car had started the first time I cranked it up, then I'd have been in the middle of it. You know, it's, uh, I wish I had it. I don't have it written down anywhere. But the man, he's, um, he wakes up in the morning, I overslept. It's wrong to you all. Then he's rushing to get, get, get himself going. And he goes, uh, to, we're called IHOP. We'll make up a name. We're called IHOP. And they bring his breakfast sandwich out to him. And it's not the right one. They took it back and they brought him something else. Then he went and, and he had a, had a meeting that he was supposed to be in, but he, he didn't get in there. But all through these things, and he just started, he started, you know, just kind of getting down on God about it. God said, well, listen, this, this is what really happened said, I'll let you sleep this morning because the death angel had come for you, but I sent my angel to fight him off. And you didn't need to see that. That sandwich you got, the first one, the one who made it was sick. And I didn't want you to be sick. Your car didn't start because if it had started, then you'd have took off right then. You'd have been involved in a, a head-on collision. All these things that happened to you that you think are so horrible, or just me working in your life protecting you. And sometimes we don't see it because we, we get hung up on being happy. But happy is a transitory thing. If you can find your joy in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you don't have to worry about being happy. You know, uh, Paul the Apostle, he spent a lot of time in jail, in prison, chained up to Roman guards and stuff. But when you read the scripture, you don't read them sitting there saying, man, this is another really ragged day. I've been chained together with these two guys, and they kept changing there for four hours. They would change out and two more guys, and man, I just get aggravated. No. When they chained them up together, he said, now let me tell you fellas about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what this man did. Let me tell you what God has done. Let me tell you. He had a captive audience for four hours, then when, when he was finished with them, he had two more in there for four more hours. You know, God uses the adversity to shape us into who we're, who we're to be. That's what he was doing with Israel, with, with Israel and Judah. He was shaping them into who they needed to be. Verse 19 says, The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. And then at the end it says, to the chief musician with stringed instruments. Miss Terry, did you bring your stringed instrument with you tonight? Yes, sir. What was up with that? 
Let's, let's read through 17, 18 again, because 17 through 19 again, because I think those are the most important verses in, the, in here, really. It says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills. And we don't have any strange instruments. But. Just the hymn effect. I don't know. I don't know. The last the whole thing was a hymn of faith. He had a prayer of faith and a hymn of faith. Didn't I tell you that? Yeah. This very first line says hymn of faith. Uh, let's go to the last slide. Okay, I thought this went good with the last couple of verses of uh, Habakkuk. If God could close the lion's mouth for Daniel, part the Red Sea for Moses, make the sun stand still for Joshua, open the prison for Peter, put a baby in Sarah's arms and raise Lazarus from the dead, then he can certainly take care of you. Have faith in God. Amen. amen. Let me hear a big amen from everybody here. Amen. Alright. Let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Close up. Father God, we thank you for this message and we thank you for the last bit of it. All of it was good. Don't get me wrong, Lord. But the last of it was the most important to me because it calls us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that no matter what the circumstances we find ourselves in, to know that we're blessed, we're greatly blessed and highly favored, and that we're lifted up by our faith in Him. And when we put our faith in God, the rest of the stuff doesn't matter so much. It just It's just stuff. It's just things. It's just uh, the world system. But sometimes even Christians get caught up in the world system when they should be concentrating on what God said, what you said, what the Word of God says, all these things. We need to make you the first thing all the time, not the first thing sometimes. But Lord God, too often when things are going good, we don't think we need you. Then things start going a little rough on us. Instead of praising you for paying attention to us, we start whining and crying about all the bad things that's happened to us. But a lot of times these bad things that happen to us is so we have something better coming around the bend. And we just have to look. We have to be ready. We have to be open to your proddings, to the things that you want us to do. Too many times we let... Uh, hard times and tribulations come up and it shuts us shuts us down on our faith. It just it pulls us away. But Lord God, that's when we need to have more faith in you. We need to have ample faith that, that you can carry us through anything that comes up. And Lord, we've had people pass away this week. And Lord, we just pray that each one of them knew Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray, God, that uh, the people here at, at this on this campus, that the ones we invite who don't come to worship and don't come to Bible study, Lord, we pray they're saved. Because if they're not, they're in a highly dangerous occupation. And they could be seeing Jesus before they know it. And it might not be just the right, they might not be seeing him in the right uh, judgment seat. Lord God, we just pray for all of them. We pray for all of them to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray for them all to come to faith in Jesus Christ if they have it. And Lord God, we we lift up these people to you. We lift them up to you. We, we, we've been doing this for eight years. Lord, we have met some fantastic people. And we've talked to some that were so far from you that no bridge would, would make it. It would take the Holy Spirit to do it. But Lord God, we try. We try every every time we come out here, every time we do a prepare a music, Miss Terry does. Every time that I prepare a message, it's always 
with the idea of people who are lost being saved come to faith in Jesus Christ. But Lord God, we thank you for your blessings. We pray, pray and thank you for, for all the ones who are faithful to come. And we lift, lift you up in the name of Jesus. Amen.